Mulligan, Ashley and Peter Palagrosi, Agnes Dillon, Amber and Dan Edwards, Donna Fyatt, Reverend Florence King, Josephine Klein, Graham Ball, Jeremy B. Lord, Luba Schneider, Mary Ellen Sherry, Joe Union, Jean Wallace, Debbie and Debbie Williams. Are there others we would mention today or other causes for which we would give thanks? Yes, Barbara. I was in St. Paul and had eye surgery a couple of weeks ago. Science surgery to repair water. It was it went without any problems, but it was not successful, so he hasn't had it again in the next week or so. So we just ask the prayers that will go well. Prayers for Colin and prayers for all of those who worry about Colin. <laughs> Others we would mention today. Yes, Fred.
by your word and spirit, that in your life we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Amen. Please be seated. Like last week, in the Gospel lesson today, Jesus turns to the world of agriculture to communicate his wisdom to the disciples. A farmer sowed a field of wheat, but at night, someone else sowed different seeds, the seeds of weeds. Wheat and weed grew along together, grew together side by side. When workers noticed these weeds, they asked whether they should pull them up. But the farmer said no. If they would gather the weeds now, they would do damage, uprooting the precious wheat along with the weeds. So they were allowed to stay in the garden to live, to grow, and to flourish. When the harvest would come some day in the future, the gardener would sort the good from the bad, gather the wheat into the barn, and toss the weeds aside. Quite unintentionally, Jesus' parable of the wheat and tares has become the theme of my garden this year. It makes me feel much, much better about my gardening skills. My garden is full of weeds right now. In the years before I had a toddler who could get in trouble at a minute's notice, I was able to spend a lot of time combing through the garden and pulling out weeds. A weeded garden is a beautiful thing, so pleasantly clean, so orderly, so predictable. What is good and desirable is kept, and what is not is tossed aside. This year, I've given up. I don't have time for it. And as the saying goes, I am in the weeds, literally and figuratively, entangled in complexities, so the weeds are there to stay. It turns out, however, that weeds are not all bad. In fact, they have many benefits. Some weeds pull up water and provide the soil with important nutrients and stability. Nature's way of fertilizing. Some weeds provide pest control. Other weeds serve as a companion plant to provide shade or to act as a trellis to climb. And other weeds, like the purslane we talked about last week, are edible and delicious. Bare soil and monocultural plant plots are rare in nature. Things grow together. So having a diverse group of plants allows for a healthier garden. Of course, there is a reason that we call weeds weeds. Not all of them are good and beneficial and life-giving. Aside from aesthetic reasons to remove weeds, some attract pests. Some have unpleasant smells, some cause root damage, and some are poisonous. Weeds grow quickly and abundantly. Too many, and they can compete for precious nutrients and overwhelm the good crops around them. Understanding how all of this works, how plants and weeds interact, is incredibly complex and nuanced. And for those of us who are just hobby gardeners with a little time, we might find ourselves lost in these weeds as well unable to determine what is good, what is bad, what is worthwhile, and what we should just allow to be. In our Old Testament lesson today, Jacob was lost in, his, in weeds of his own. Weeds of great complexity. He was on the run. As we read about last week, he tricked his older brother Esau into giving up his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. And then, Jacob conspired with his mother to deceive his father into giving him a blessing as well as the birthright. 
And now, in the lesson today, he was on the run from Esau, who wanted to kill him. He was sent away by his father to find a wife, away from the mother whom he dearly loved. And I imagine that as he traveled those lonely, dusty roads, he was filled with terror and complex emotions. Jacob wanted more in life than the role of a second-born son. And he used cunning and deceit to get what he wanted. But it came at a great cost. He was uprooted from the life he knew, lost in stress and anxiety, entangled in family conflict. He might not have been able to see what is good and what is bad, to weigh what is worthwhile and what should just let be. And so one night as Jacob rested, as Jacob wrestled in his mind, God visited him in a dream. He dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and on top of it, and the top of it reached into heaven, angels ascending and descending. The Lord stood beside him and reminded him of all of the promises that the Lord had made. Know that I am with you, God said, and will keep you wherever you go. When Jacob awoke, he knew that God had been with him in that place, lost in the middle of the desert. And in that brief moment when earth and heaven came near, Jacob's eyes were opened. He saw a reality that he could not see through the weeds of the struggles of his life. He saw beyond the confusion and ambiguity of the choices he had made. He saw a greater reality of God. Lost in the weeds, God was still with him. There are times in life when we are just as lost as Jacob. Our families enter into conflict. Our children exhaust us. Our jobs wear us down. The politics of our country dishearten. <clears throat> Tragedies around the globe disorient. When we are overwhelmed, it becomes difficult to know what is good and what is bad. What is wheat and what is weed? What is worth our time? And what is better left alone? How then can we tend the gardens of our lives when we cannot see clearly what is in front of us in plain sight? In our psalm lesson today, the psalmist posits an answer. The reality of God, the psalmist says, is far greater than what we can comprehend or understand. The psalmist exclaims, O oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search my path. You are acquainted with my ways. Where can I flee from your presence? In heaven you are there, in hell you are there, and, in the wing, and if I take the wings of the morning to the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. This is the nature of God's relationship with us. Ever present, ever knowing, ever compassionate. Wherever we find ourselves, God sees the wheat and weeds in our lives, the good and bad. God knows them intimately and is with us in them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. If there is wicked in me, lead me in the way everlasting. We cannot see clearly, but the good news is that we do not have to. God sees for us.
times God opens our eyes to the reality which is veiled to us. And we see a glimpse of the way everlasting. And in those brief moments, when heaven and earth meet, we know, we know deep in our beings that God is there. Whatever else things seem to be. God sees what is good and what is not. And God cultivates within us what is healthy and life-giving, whether we want God to or not. God is with us, sometimes in spite of us. And nevertheless, God works in us so that when the harvest comes, the fruit will be good. Life in God's beautiful, complex world is life in an untamed garden, filled with varieties of lives and plants we cannot control or comprehend. But God is everywhere in it. We cannot escape the loving care of the gardener, providing for wheat and wheat. So when we feel lost in the weeds of life, we are not alone. God comes to us and shows us what is good, what is bad, what is worth our time, and what is better left alone. Reminding us that there is hope to come. There is a way everlasting. Amen. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us. He gave himself for us in offering
and bless all who will receive through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.